Hi, hello everyone. Um, so thanks for the invite. Great notice, but um, always a pleasure. Um, so yes, uh, my name is Mikael Sana. I work for Microsoft, and I'm a kernel developer, and I'm mostly the uh, mainer of Nanlock, which is a new LSM, Linux Linux module, um, which well entered in mainline uh, two years ago. Um, so it's pretty recent, uh, but still, um, well, most, I guess, um, generic Linux distro um, enabled today, Nanlock. And um, yeah, this talk is about a new feature that was, uh, well, that is undergoing development, uh, an important one. Uh, but before that, I'll give you some context, explain what is Lanlock, uh, why you may want to use it, and then why it's kind of new feature might help you. So first, uh, let me explain what is sandboxing, uh, how I different sandboxing. Um, well, sandboxing, for me, is mainly a secret approach to isolate a piece of software from the rest of the system. So, well, you might think um, an innocuous and trusted process can become malicious during its lifetime. So uh, it's not only to protect against uh, untrusted code, but even uh, against uh, trusted code, even your own code, because while well, with a secret vulnerability, it might become malicious. Um, so there's two main properties for a sandbox that we want to have and to keep over time. Uh, first is to follow the least privilege principle. So you don't want, in general, you don't want to give more privileges, more permissions to a process, to an application, to be able to restrict itself. Um, you want just to be able to drop privileges. And, well, you also might want uh, security which is onicus, uh, innocuous and compatible. So this is kind of a, a requirement for uh, unprivileged security policies. Uh, this means that the security policy should not harm the system, it should not harm anything uh, outside the sandbox itself. So uh, it should be safe to use and uh, composable, which means uh, it should be usable with other um, kind of concurrent security policies. Uh, in practice, you may want to sandbox multiple applications and each of them might be kind of standalone and not uh, interfere with others. So what is LANOC? Um, well, LANOC is kind of a, the first monetary access control system uh, on Linux for unprivileged uh, processes. So you might know SecComp, SecComp BPF. So this is kind of similar, except SecComp is dedicated to filter syscalls. Uh, so it can block uh, raw syscall IDs and raw arguments, but it cannot uh, difference pointers. You cannot, uh, you cannot filter anything um, according to a path, according to, uh, well, high, well, let's say, kernel semantic. But Lanlock is dedicated to field syscall. So it is kind of um, SLinux, Appamore, or stuff like that, but dedicated to unfledged processes. Um, so this enables developers to add built-in sandboxing into the applications, to sandbox the application, and then protect their users. Um, so that, again, um, might apply to interested applications. So you might, run, you might want to run an application that you don't trust, and you might not want this kind of application to have, well, all your users' uh, privileges, uh, to have access to your SSH key and so on. Um, but another use case uh, is also to sandbox your application, uh, well, to make sure that even if there's a vulnerability, a security vulnerability, um, known or not, well, uh, you kind of get some advance. Uh, you kind of are able to um, uh, save some time and be quicker to update an update to fix the issue while making the life uh, more difficult for attackers. So now let's see in practice how this works and what it can do. The, Currently, the main access control types which can be enforced are uh, related to the file system. More are coming, but uh, well, we need to start with something, so that is the first step, which is very interesting, but doesn't cover everything. So what you can do, uh, 
when you're standardizing your application R as a one, is, uh, for instance, to control what can be executed by the kernel, what can be read or write, um, if you can read uh, the content of a directory, if you can create files, and if you can rename a link, which are kind of uh, special uh, operations. And for this, you may want to tie this ISX write to file hierarchies. So what makes sense for the user is to, well, say, well, I want my application to only be, be able to, to have access to one directory, um, let's say slash TMT directory, but not uh, something else. So you can express this kind of uh, stuff uh, thanks to many free syscalls, which were introduced uh, at the same time. Now, like, create, create rule set to create a rule set, then you get a file descriptor, and then you can populate this rule set with a new syscall, which, which is Lanlock add rule. And then finally, when you're set, you can enforce this rule set on the current thread, the same way you can enforce a filter with seccomp. And that is uh, possible thanks to the Lanlock create, uh, Lanlock uh, restrict self syscall. So let me show you an example of this kind of security policies and how you can nest security policies. Um, let's say this a first security, which is enforced by, let's say, the service which is in charge of uh, user login. So you might want to enforce a security policy which is kind of <coughs> generic, so that, do not, that does not restrict a lot, but still. Uh, so in this case, well, uh, the user name user can access its home directory uh, in a read and write way and can execute some applications, some binaries in the slash user directory. But um, let say this user launch a new application, which is um, an application to display pictures. So this application can be sent back to, it can then enforce a third one layer. So the first layer will still be enforced, but the second will be enforced too. Um, so in this case, um, well, this application might want to access its, its uh, config directory and its cache directory too. And because it is a well, application to display uh, pictures, it might also need to access a picture directory, but only in a real way. And let's say the application is well sandboxed, so it can take load its sandboxing over time, and especially when opening a new file. Let's say the user want to open the cool.jpg image. Then, just before opening it and passing this file that might contain malicious content and uh, interested data, um, well, this display application can again sandbox it, sandbox itself, but restrict uh, furthermore. So in this case, uh, well, it might still have uh, need access to the cache directory, but only to have uh, a read access to the cool.jpg file and not any other uh, <laughs> pictures in this directory. So that is our third layer. And how does the kernel deal with that? So when the application requests to open this file, uh, the kernel will uh, kind of check the leaf, the node, the file, which is uh, requested by the application, in this case, a cool.jpg uh, file. And because the request is to read this file, uh, well, you can, can check that there's at least one layer, in this case, a third layer, that allows this action. But that is not enough. Uh, all three layers need to be, well, need to approve this access. And so the kernel uh, walk path to the um, walk back to uh, the file hierarchy and find then that the second layer grants access in a read way to the picture directory. So uh, now we have two layers that granted access to this request and we need another one. And well, as a matter of fact, is the home directory, which is uh, allowed to be read by the first layer. So in this case, uh, there is one request one access request to read the cool.jpg file, and all these three layers, all these three sandboxes, uh, granted this access. So it's okay, and the app can open this file, pass it, and potentially, well, uh, change its behavior and become malicious. But if it becomes malicious, it will not be able to access 
let's say, your SSH keys, uh, your personal pictures, and so on. So now let's talk about a new feature that uh, we're working on. Um, so as I said before, uh, LearnLock is kind of a work in progress. It's useful as is, but it's gaining more and more features over time. Um, yeah, and one of these features is, well, will be to be able to log accesses, and that might be useful for different use cases. But first, let me explain you the non-goal uh, and Tracking access requests is not a goal of this patch series for many two reasons. First one is that Lonlock is not an access tracking mechanism. Um, it is designed to sandbox applications uh, if they want to, so it's, uh, they need to be willing to sandbox uh, themselves. And third one, because, well, you cannot do that. You cannot track accesses uh, with the LSM framework on itself um, because, well, mainly, uh, it is kind of an API and framework which is designed to restrict accesses, to add more restrictions over the commonly uh, access control. Um, and another example is because uh, LSMs in some way can be stacked. And well, by the way, Lanlock is fully stackable, so you can use Lanlock with SNUX, Apamo, or whatever you want. Um, and because it's stackable, uh, and you don't want to perform two checks uh, that both return a denial, uh, well, the first one with, will just stop um, the stack of LSMs, and the second, the third, and so on, will not get this access request. But if you want to track accesses or track other stuff, well, there's other tools uh, that the kernel provides, and also other well, other features that you can provide and other tools, uh, for instance, uh, F-Trace and VPF. So what are the goals of this log support? Uh, so first, um, let me explain you five use cases that might be kind of uh, similar, but maybe not. Uh, first, for application developers, uh, well, if you want to do Mac stuff, you need to be able to know what's going on and kind of debug what you're doing. Same way you want to debug if uh, you can access, you can, you can pass some stuff, you can access the network and so on. Um, so yeah, that is important to be able to speed up the sandboxing in deployment. Second use case for, for users, so probably um, most of you um, that want to listen what's going on in your system. You want to know what, uh, why an access is not uh, granted to an application you sandbox yourself, or maybe you're running a sandboxer, so kind of a container manager, but for a sandbox, and you want to know well what's going on. Uh, third use case for system interpreter. So these cases, uh, well, you might want to help your users and uh, kind of find out before an issue is reported what kind of weird or uncommon behavior is happening. Um, and some other users, uh, well, let's say distro mainers that control all the distros, other fleets, might also want to uh, get some usage statistics, some metrics on what is going on if uh, the applications that think are sandboxed are, uh, in fact, really sandboxed and well sandboxed. If there's some uh, access requests which are denial and that should not happen. And the last use case is kind of similar to this one too, but again, a bit different. It's to be able to, well, kind of walk through logs uh, after an, a security incident and know uh, what happened. And to kind of get some clues if an attacker tries to access something and try to bypass sandbox or try to exploit some applications. And well, my luck in this case, um, might also raise some flags, and that might also be useful to well, track uh, an attack. Um, but implementing um, logging for this kind of uh, security features is not simple. Uh, there's some changes here, and well, to to list a few. Well, mainly it is. The main challenge is because Sunlock is dedicated to unpaid users. 
So um, that comes with uh, constraints. And well, for instance, you might not want uh, users to fill your log with stuff that, you, that don't matter. Um, but there's also some mechanism which are specific to a log, and you need to take that into account. So as I just explained before, you can nest sandboxes, which means there's multiple layers, and they, are also, they can also be composed. So you might have, uh, one, let's say, one web, web browser, which is sandbox, and at the same time, a text editor, and both of them may have different security policies. But both of them may log uh, deny accesses. So you need to identify where this access request comes from. Um, but also not to clutter your logs uh, with too much information. So that is, uh, that needs to be taken into account. And also the dynamic aspect, which is that um, at runtime, at boot time, uh, there's no security policies um, used at all. Uh, the first one might be loaded into, into the kernel with the first sandbox applications, and it might also vanish when this application just terminates. And at the same time, well, you can have different applications uh, popping and sandboxing themselves, and then, uh, well, just exiting, and at the same time, other one popping, and so on. So, uh, yeah, there's kind of different aspect to keep in mind. And, um, yeah. So, I did the first batch choice, uh, first proposal, an RFC, and yeah, I want to address these kind of issues. And you also wonder, well, what logs should, should enable? Um, what we want to have, the kind of information we want to, to have access to when we are developing Sandbox, or when you're uh, well, looking at your logs and investigating an incident or something like that, well, uh, you need to identify deny accesses. Well, load accesses, most of the time, are not relevant because they were explicitly allowed. Um, and because you may have different nested sandboxes, there's multiple layers, and, well, multiple, several of them might deny a request. So I think what makes the most, most sense is to log the, how I call it, the youngest security domain, so the, the latest sandbox that was uh, enforced on the thread, and kind of ignore the rest because, um, well, whatever the rest, the first to block, to deny an access, is, I think, the most relevant. And to be able to, if you're building a sandbox, you may also want to get some information of what was requested and what is missing. But mostly, what is missing? Because that, is, that was not part of the policy at first. So uh, yeah, you may want to kind of do the intersection between the access request and the security policy to only extract what is relevant and um, not have too much logs again. You may also want to identify which domain is it, which sandbox it is. And so this might include, well, some sandbox hierarchy. And you need to follow, to be able to follow lifetime these sandboxes um, and this rule set when you're creating some stuff and then using them. And yeah, as a reminder, uh, well, logs might contain sen sensitive data. So this should not be able, and most of the time it is not available to infinite users. So that is kind of, um, that might be useful for developers because they can have access to their own machine logs, um, but that might not be available to fully infinite users, but still to core users. So that should fit, that, that, that should fit um, the, well, the, what we're looking for um, without um, any security issue. Because whoever can access your logs can already access a lot of stuff, sensitive stuff, so it should be uh, restricted. And 
yeah, so I guess uh, you're already fine out, but uh, this can be done thanks to the audit framework, which is kind of the main uh, access log system, uh, which is used by Linux and most LSMs and um, most access control stuff and even not access related stuff. Okay, so now let's see something more concrete. Um, at the top of the screen, uh, you can see something which is dark and empty for now, but you will see the log of, well, the audit log. And at the bottom of the screen, uh, well, there's a shell, and on this shell, well, you might notice I'm, I'm running it at, run, at root, which might not be a good thing, but it depends of what you're doing, but it doesn't really matter with Linux because Linux can sandbox everything. Um, but even with root, there's some issues. So you should not use root for that, but it's okay to test it and to dev with that. And yeah, so I will use um, a tool which is provided by the, well, with the kernel sources, uh, which is called Sandboxer. You can find it in the samples landlock directory in the Linux kernel source uh, tree. And well, that is a sample. You can do basic sandboxing stuff, um, which is already, I think, powerful. And yeah, I will use that to explain um, what's going on here. So you can configure this, this sandbox um, with two environment variables. The first one is, well, LL for landlock, file system read only. And in this case, well, I want the bash application to have access to well, the main uh, Linux directories in a read-only way, and also exec executable way. So you may want to execute applications in slash VSA and so on. And in this case, I also want to grant access to the home directory uh, in a read-only way. And there's also another environment uh, viable, which enables to grant access to a read and write way to some files or file archives. And yeah, in this case, it's mostly def null, def pool, which might be useful, and well, slash tmp. So let's do this. Let's uh, launch bash with this access restrictions enforced. What you can see at the top is a few lines, a uh, few lines that were generated with uh, the audit framework. You can see well which thread uh, did a specific action. In this case, it was the sandbox application that uh, wanted to create a rule set, and this rule set is name one. And this rule set can handle um, a set of access rights, which are defined here, and which are a set of access rights that Glanlo can currently handle. handle. Once you have this rule set, you can then populate this rule set with some rules, and that is not locked yet. And once your rule set is ready, you can restrict your own process. And in this case, well, the sandboxer wants to restrict itself just before uh, calling execv with bash. So you can see there's a restrict self action with domain two, which is new one. And this new domain is created uh, from the first rule set. So you can infer what are the properties of this domain, which means this sandbox. Um, and yeah, its parent is zero, which means, well, there's no parent. Um, so it's kind of layer one. Then, well, that might be useful to track the lifetime of kind of objects. And in this case, uh, well, set one is released, which means the release file explorer is closed. And then you can see the first access request, which was denied. And what well, you can see it is an open operation that returns uh, 13, which is e access. And you can see the reason why it was denied. So there's two fields here. The first one, which is missing FS access, which contains two access rights, two missing access rights. Write file and read file, because bash at first uh, 
Well, try to open the, uh, in this case, the FTTY file in a read and write way. I guess it's because of compatibility, compatibility reasons. And you can get some information about this file. Uh, so that's great, but well, bash works fine without that, so good. Um, so here I'm in a sandbox, a new one, and well, I can see that here, for instance, I list the content of the slash directory, which should be designed, because well, the slash directory is not part of this configuration. So yeah, if the sandbox bash tries to read that, uh, then I can log what well, first deny and then log um, which process tried to do an action, which was denied. And it was denied with a second sandbox, domain two, because it was, there were an open action, and well, in this case, the read the access right uh, was missing. But you can also see that there's a missing permissions, and that is kind of specific to Lanlock for this uh, first actions, the access request, it is empty, but um, in fact, Planlock must take a bit more that we just saw because um, otherwise there's some kernel actions, kernel features that my, uh, let's say, mega sandbox useless, bypass, trivially bypass sandbox, uh, which instance uh, we could, well, as root, for instance, we could uh, mount or unmount some file system and then get access to stuff that we hadn't uh, expected before. So for instance, if we want to unmount, uh, let's say the dev um, jQuery, uh, you'll see what well, is not uh, allowed. Well, it must be super user. I guess I'm a super user, but a sandbox super user. And you see, well, the unmount program was denied by second sandbox. Well, the first sandbox, which is called domain two. And we got an EPUM uh, denial. No missing access, no specific uh, missing um, access rights, because is, well, this kind of action is just denied by default. If you want to enforce any file system, we need to hit access console. So anything, any syscall that might change the file system layout will be denied. So that will be the same if you want to call private root, if you want to mount something, and so on. Um, that is a limitation, but that should not be an issue in most use cases when you want to sandbox applications. Um, there's, by the way, there's still some work in progress, especially um, while well, bringing network access control um, to landlock. And in this case, if you don't restrict any first uh, access, uh, then you will be able to do whatever you want because it will not impact the security see you enforce on the process. And let's try something else. Um, well, you all know S-Trace, which is a way to trace and even impersonate processes, so kind of bypass processes. And well, if you're in Sandbox, you should not be able to easily tamper with a process which is outside the Sandbox. In this case, let's say PD1, and if I want to p-trace uh, this process, uh, it is denied, and you can see in the log why it was denied, because it was a missing permission, which is kind of a generic uh, abstract permission uh, specific to Lanark. That's it. Um, I can also uh, do, um, let's say, oops. Another sandbox, and this time, let's say there is no access to slash home directory. So, first, well, you can see I can list the content of my directory, my home directory, but if I want to uh, restrict everything, I can, and I, ca I can create a second layer. In this case, it will not have access to the home directory. So, you can see there's a second reset created, and um, more specifically, um, you can see this uh, second domain, which is called domain four, which was created uh, from rule set three. 
And yeah, now I cannot list the content of the home directory and that is denied. Uh, that was denied by domain four, which is the second layer. So you can see here uh, the IDs are sequential numbers. And well, to make sure that we don't um, mix rule set IDs and domain IDs where they use the same counter. Okay, that's it. So what's next? Um, so after some discussions, um, I think this kind of new features will also make sense. Um, so you might know SACOMP. SACOMP uh, enables to enforce restrictions on syscalls and also enables to well, log these uh, denials. And well, we can do something similar with Landlock, but yeah, that's kind of different. So I think the next patch here is, uh, so the first one was sent a few days ago, and you're free to reply, take a look, take a look and to request uh, features if you want. Um, so for the free analytics syscalls, uh, one option which might be useful is to be able to opt in for, for login because, well, you might not want to run an application on the kernel and with some application on your work kernel and then, well, have your log filled uh, with our log entries. So, yeah, that should be, I guess, uh, an opt-in um, uh, check. For the landlock add rule syscall, um, well, you may also want to log some allowed access. Um, that might also help to debug applications to see which rules uh, match a specific access request. And third, for the non-log plastic self Cisco, so the Cisco that really enforce a sandbox on the ground thread, uh, well, you might not want to log anything at all. Uh, because, for instance, if you're sandboxing a malicious application or at least a, an untrusted application, well, you know that a lot of access requests will be denied. So, yeah, you might want to just ignore that. And last but not least, uh, one really interesting Features, a really interesting ID, will be to have a permissive mode. So you might know this kind of wording from the SNX world. Um, so in actual, well, by default, when you enforce, when you restrict a thread, um, well, everything is, well, every, everything which is not allowed is denied. With permissive mode, it will be kind of a way to not enforce a respect, but the rule set, but still load it in the kernel and log what would be denied if this was really enforced. And that is, that will be really useful. Um, well, for instance, to be able to know which kind of access your application needs, or even if it's not your applications. So yeah, it might be a time saver to build a sandbox and yeah, quickly come to something useful. And that works. Then there is also some ideas uh, that will not be part of this patch series, but um, yeah, that might help to understand what we're looking for. Uh, we like to be able to target unfriended users. So uh, as I said, the audit logs are privileged on the access to, well, many routes. But you might also want to get some data, even if you're not root. And for that, what could be useful is a new interface. So what is common in Linux is to get some new file systems to expose some internal data or metadata. But there's some challenges here, um, especially about IDs. So you saw the log. Well, I use uh, counter and then sequential IDs. So that is easy, easy to understand, easy to do, and it works well. But uh, we should not expose this kind of information to interface users because this kind of leaks uh, metadata to them. For instance, the minor if there's other, other sandboxes uh, on the system, if they are not the first layer or not, if they are not the first layer. And yeah, 
how many sandboxes uh, or processes box were spawned and so on. But we still like to get some interesting properties from this ID. So we might want to be able to easily co co correlate, uh, to tie uh, an ID um, from a sandbox to the same view of a nested sandbox. So you need to have something consistent. And you might also want to tie these IDs to the logs. So, yeah, not easy to do, but that might be interesting. And last thing that we like to get, which is not yet good for Nanak and for a lot of other kind of features, I guess, is to support uh, Creo, uh, which is a way to you know snapshot your system and restore it to a previous state. And for that, well, you need to have reproducible data, metadata, and then in this case, IDs. So you need to have a user space interface, load these IDs, and so on, and to be efficient. If it's based on the counter, well, it will not work very well, because if you launch like a lot of sandboxes, you will need to kind of simulate these same sandboxes just for getting the right ID, the right number. So that will not be efficient at all. And yeah, by the way, that's why there's some kernel interfaces um, to kind of pick um, a specific file descriptor number or even what well, to help for process uh, IDs. So yeah, I'm open to any suggestion, feedback, uh, now or later. If you're curious, you can take a look at the first RFC uh, that is a few days old. Uh, to give you an idea of the next steps uh, for Nanak, well, um, we are working on new access control types uh, for the file system, for instance, IOCTLs. And because, as you may know, you can do a lot of stuff with IOCTLs, and you might want to restrict that, but not to have a too complex system to restrict that too. Um, and we're also working on TCP restrictions uh, to kind of uh, have local and really simple firewalls uh, specific to applications and embedded into an application. Um, well, this is work ongoing for the object framework. And of course, uh, there's some plan to improve um, performance of all this implementation. So if you want to contribute, there's plenty of stuff to do, um, either from kernel side or from user side. And if you want to just use Unlock, please do. Um, if you have any question, there is a main list. Uh, we can answer and help you with that. There are also other, um, uh, other resources. Uh, for instance, there is a recent workshop that I gave a few days ago um, and a lot of uh, documentation. But you can still improve it if there is some stuff missing. And yeah, for some incentive, you might want to uh, look at some rewards program if you want to send back your application or even other applications. Thank you. And yeah, if you have any question, thank you to ask. Hi. On about the fifth slide, before you went to the logs, you were showing the file system, and it was uh, your example was a, an image viewer opening the JPEG file, and you used overlays of the policies. Mm -hmm. How does it undo that final overlay when it said, oh, I only want access to this one JPEG file and my cache directory? Do you have to fork into a separate process and apply that policy? Or when you've finished reading the file, how do you undo that policy? How do you then make things laxer again? So um, which kind of cache are you talking about? In your example, you had yeah. a cache directory. Oh, yeah. It was just that as you tightened the policy up, yeah. The question, my question is, how do you then undo that final step? How do you get from here back to the previous step? Or don't you? Do you have to fork a process to do this? This part? Oh, okay. So once the once a thread is sandbox, it cannot revert its own sandbox. There's just layer of stacking and stacking. Okay, so it's fork and imp and apply this and do the work. Yeah, and then it's exit. And, yeah, Fine. Thank you. yeah. 
when, when you're looking to uh, virtualize this, um, don't expose IDs. I, I was just not exposing these things as numbers, but as long strings of letters. Uh, something like what three words, perhaps, you know, that, that, that kind of um, encoding, because people, people can very easily deal with rule set number three. But trying to distinguish between rule set number 33949 and 33349, that, that, that breaks people's brains. They're not good at that. So I would, I would suggest doing something more complicated that you can turn back into an ID internally, but you know, maybe, maybe hash. Like, do, do something. And I don't think you're going to be entirely able to um, prevent interference between two, um, two different processes because you need to make sure there is a unique name so the system administrator has some idea about what's going on. And I mean, I think we have this problem already with um, virtualizing PIDs and all, all the other virtualization stuff that goes on. So yeah. it's not that there's no precedent for this kind of thing inside the kernel. So try, try, try looking at some of those implementations and see, see what you can borrow. Yeah, thanks. So yeah, just to kind of reply on the string stuff. So um, yeah, first, you can see the audit framework is mostly about strings. Um, I did the first implementation, for instance, where I just uh, put some bid mask here because it was simpler and, well, simpler as a kernel developer. But um, I think it's not the ways audit logs are used and they should be kind of self sufficient. Um, so, using strings instead of IDs, for instance, here, um, yeah, might also be. Something to consider. Um, downside is, um, well, you need to manage strings. That might help if you want to nest stuff and make this more obvious. But at the same time, well, this kind of uh, sandbox archies entries um, could become really complex. So I'm not sure kind of using strings to expose that uh, will help much because it will still miss a lot of information because you'll need to have the domain properties and a lot of stuff. So what I try to do with this approach is to have some, something which might be useful on its own uh, if you get uh, an edit entry, a line, but you will never, you cannot put all the relevant information on one line you need to have something, some tool that tracks stuff and that digests these logs to make something more, well, useful and stateful. Um, and about the virtualization of IDs, yeah, that is uh, really the, what we like to do. Um, and yeah, at the same time, the thing is, um, you may not want to have a, an idea key because, well, uh, that is more complex, um, and you also don't well dealing with hierarchies and composability. So all this virtualization ID um, is um, yeah you, you might you might you might be the root looking at the logs. So getting one view of the things and also a user which is already sandbox and getting another view of the things. And as a developer, you might, in for instance, have two console at the same, two time like, uh, with two accounts. And then you may, if you see the same domain, same sandbox with different IDs, different names, that would be confusing. So I would like to avoid that and keep, keep it simple on the kernel, uh, uh, kernel code side and use user-based tools to kind of uh, yeah, get more features and more stuff that could be useful. But yeah, it's not easy. Thank you. I got a question about um, the ability to progressively lock down stuff. So um, for example, if I have a program 
which needs to access slash etc or whatever to read config files and after that it starts accepting network connections. So obviously we would like to drop privileges as much as possible before accepting external input which may cause uh, funny security bugs. So is there a way to progressively lock down stuff more and more without restarting some sort of application? Yeah. And that is what I tried to explain with this example. So the example, the first layer is, let's say, the login manager, right? And the second and third layer is, in fact, the same application. That first load, as you say it, well, really like your example, uh, can load the kind of generic sandbox policies for its own use. And with this policy, it can read its configuration part, you see? But when the configuration is read, and before parting interested data, it can add another layer and kind of tighten its own sandboxing. Thanks. And um, so um, my problem probably was that I thought uh, all these layers should have been loaded at the same time. So you can just load them over time, more and more layers. How would that layer policy also affect, for example, if I'm forking off a new um, program below that? So uh, does the new program inherit the old rules? Yeah. So um, as I said, um, landlock security policies and what we should expect from sandboxing is that it, is, it only impacts the thread process, the ambition that sandbox itself. And of course, everything which is spawned after that. So every fork, every clone called, every execv, whatever, inherits this and cannot escape from this sandbox. Um, and yeah, I guess I answered the question. And yeah, the parents are not affected at all. Just to clarify the last question, is, is this applied per thread or per process? Sorry? Just to clarify the last question, because um, all this lockdown, is this applied per thread, i.e. distinct threads within a process can have different policies, or is it per process inherited by all and shared by all threads in the process? So this follows the, the way the Linux scanner handles credentials, which is by thread. So if you have a process, a multi thread process, you should be careful to know, well, you should know which process first starts, which, which thread, I mean, first starts, and give, give, him, give it the responsibility to sandbox itself, and then, well, before creating new threads. Or you can you could also have different security policy per thread, but that should not be um, a strict security boundary, because, well, there is no most of the time, there is, in fact, some kind of features to uh, have a more strict boundaries between the threads, but that is really not common. So, yeah, you should not consider um, different threads as malicious. Yeah, but um, one feature I didn't talk about uh, would be like is done for SecComp to be able to sandbox all the threads from the same process if. They are the, if they have the same credential. So that should avoid uh, these kind of issues. Um, how does this interact with uh, set UID binaries? So if I do it like in your example, start a process as a user and sandbox it and then use sudo? Yeah, so as SecComp, um, you need to call this uh, syscall, the PRCTL syscall with non retrieves If you don't have the Capsys admin, well, if you have the Capsys admin, you should not. Uh, but otherwise, you need to call this. And if you call this, the set non retrieves uh, you will be able to execute set UID binaries, but you will not be able to get their um, new UID, so we will not get new privileges. Which will be a way to escape the sandbox. Um, 
Is there any automatic conversion available from, for example, app armor policies to landlock policies? So you could use that as a starting point? Nope, there's nothing yet. Uh, but if you want to work on that, uh, I'd be pleased to help you. Um, do you recommend using Landlock alone as a sandboxing solution or coupling it with the uh, SecComp and other filtering, uh, Cisco filtering solution? So, um, well, if you can, if you have enough time, and uh, yeah, you should use as much security features as possible. Um, Landlock doesn't replace SecComp, it doesn't replace SNNX, it doesn't replace AppArmor. It is another way, a complementary way to hard on your system or your applications. Um, second, the goal of SecComp is to reduce the kernel attack surface. The goal of Landlock is to enforce an access control system, to an, an access control. So that is not the same goal, but most of the time, if you want to run especially interested applications or potentially compromised applications, you want to use both. Thank you.